Swirly Swirly. Welcome back to the number of those to these crazy people that just eat me and can't stop talking about it. Feel bad for those wearing headphones. Yeah. You sorry, guys. If I blow out your eardrums, my bad. Uh, so, anyways, we got Dragon Shirt, Dragon Ball Z, uh, Wingnut, Wingman, Justin, All Out Life, Carnivore. Hello. Good to see everybody once again, or hear, or see. I don't know. I can see myself. That's that's the important part. <laughs> and of course, me, Thomas Allen Clark, the wizard of mockery, just here to entertain. So, anyways, uh, I want to thank everybody for viewing. Justin, why don't you hit him up with the smack the like button? Yeah. Hey, welcome to it. And he freezes. <laughs> Welcome to another live stream. Welcome to another video. Uh, I'm back to the computer today. That's why I'm freezing. You'd think the computer would run better than the laptop, but 10 years in technology appears to make a difference. So there we go. Um, so uh, today uh, we have a few different topics. I know we're, we're kind of just out here swinging today. Uh, we've got an article on TMAO. Uh, from the uh, Miss Georgia Eads, and it uh, might take a turn that we don't expect. Uh, Tom has a few stories to tell. I have a couple stories. We might have a special guest come in in, in about a half hour or so. That would be great. Uh, Tom just needs to keep his eye out on the uh, on the break room or the green room here on the good old stream yard. Uh, but yes, please make sure you're subscribed. Or if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. I mean, what are you doing? please subscribe. It's free. Um, hit that like button if you haven't yet. Go ahead and hit that like. Slam a steak, slam a lamb, slam a lamb chop, whatever. Slam a mammoth bone on that. Hit that notification bell so that you know whenever each of our videos comes out. Something's premiering, something's coming out. We're doing a live. Might do an unexpected live here and there if me and Tom ever get a free minute or a right. free hour. Uh, and of course, your comments are really helpful. Pass the video on to uh, people that like Carnivore and your friends. Uh, and uh, Pat, if you don't like the video, make sure you go pass it on to your enemies, people that you don't like. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you have an old laptop, old tablet sitting around, go ahead and just pull up our videos, pull up all our videos. Just let the channel run all day. Come on. Why not? Yeah. Why not let it play all day? <laughs> While you're at work, you know, keep your cat or your dog entertained with Justin's hijinks. Right. There you go. I'm sure I'm I've, I've highly acclaimed by cats, or so they've told me. So there you go. Plus, cats are carnivore, unless they're by a very terrible cat vegan owner, you know, that tries to feed them kibble, even though most people feed their cats kibble. And then uh, <clears throat> they... Uh, uh, end up having a cat that's like metabolically unhealthy, like my cat. But if I ever get a new cat, I will start the cat on the carnivore diet instead of. But he's good. He's like 12 years old now, I think. Can't wait to see him when I get to visit home. I'm more excited to see my cat than I am my mom. We already got a chat from my Kamaj, Myo Kamaj. Yeah, it's, uh, you want to read his comment or you want me to? I could read it. I'm already talking. I'm speaking. They don't know how I eat my carnivore cereal. Um, I read that there is a high overlap between autism and metabolic disorder. Do you have any more info on this? Uh, do you want me to start or do you want to start, Tom? Uh, you go ahead and start. I got plenty to say, of course. <laughs> okay. I'll keep on being the uh, chatty chat box. Uh, yeah. So... Um, the way I would like to start with this is, and we've talked about it before, and I don't remember if we still have the article, but I think the video is floating around somewhere, um, of a correlation, of course, or correlation is not causation, or rather association between a mother having metabolic dysfunction, uh, pre-diabetes, um, maybe what would be termed as um, gestational diabetes, which is uh, diabetes during pregnancy, because uh, there's some insulin changes that happen uh, during pregnancy uh, that we can cover. Uh, and seems to be linked that mother having uh, higher blood sugar 
less metabolic control, in elevated insulin levels, uh, seem to having an effect on the metabolic uh, and, and hormones of the child uh, during gestation, uh, causing being related to some kind of brain, uh, I don't want to use the word dysfunction, but issues with the brain, basically, due to the metabolic dysfunction in uh, gestation uh, during the pregnancy period. Uh, not sure about what trimester specifically, uh, but typically people that eat bad uh, they just eat worse while they're pregnant because they see it as an excuse to kind of, for some reason, pack on the pounds, not trying to be insulting, but just kind of eat what they want, you know, weird cravings, things like that. We've all heard the stories. Um, shout out to my cousin and his girlfriend. They are recently expecting, and I went and visited them last weekend and she was sitting there on the couch popping Starburst. And I wanted to like grab them and like punch her in the face. Um, but that would have been a crime. And my cousin probably wouldn't have liked that. But I'm like, girl, get off the sugar. You really got to get off the sugar now that you're pregnant. And, you know, doctors won't tell them that, unfortunately. Um, they'll do, the, you know, at least not until they do like blood tests and stuff like that. And it's like, oh, you're diabetic or you have... Or even then, who knows, right? The system's so messed up. Uh, so to me, that's that's a link. Um, now, as far as after that, I'm not sure. Um, just because eating poorly is so disseminated throughout the population that it would be hard to see, at least in my opinion, anything different than... Like, okay, when because you know autism, although they're getting better at diagnosing it earlier, um, some people aren't diagnosed until later in life. Some people when they're seven or eight, um, and so that's already seven or eight years typically of poor um, eating. Now, something I came across once, and I really wish I could find the video again, is someone speaking about the link between formula. Uh, which is void of animal fat, and that being possibly another causal link between the setting in of autism-like behaviors uh, early in childhood. Um, so the idea there is that because the brain in the first <laughs> year is growing so rapidly, it needs um, animal fat uh, saturated fat in order to grow properly. And so if for whatever reason, the mother does not breastfeed, uh, the child does not get enough natural animal fat, saturated fats. If they don't add butter to formula, what have you, um, then the idea is, is that with the brain growing so fast with it, not having enough fat, um, it leading to, uh, dysfunction and thus could possibly present as autism. So there's two little things uh, or could possibly be big things uh, very, very early in childhood. Um, after that, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think the water just gets muddier and muddier as the child grows and the later someone finds out that they were autistic or that they are autistic. That's kind of where I'm at it with it. Yeah, let me uh, throw this up. Hopefully... You can see it okay. I think this is kind of what you were touching on. Yeah. Um, there's a very strong association between um, pregnant mothers with high A1, A <coughs> excuse me, A1C values, hemoglobin A1C values, and giving birth to um, uh, autistic children. So, um, again, I like to uh, point people back to the contrast between. Um, Gosh, what was his name? Timothy, Dr. Timothy something. Anyways, he wrote a book called uh, My Daughter Rachel Did Not Get Autism from Vaccine or something like that. And then um, is it J.B. Handley wrote the book that kind of shows a contrast between the two because uh, 
<clears throat> my the book my uh, my daughter Rachel did not get autism from vaccine or whatever is a is a fellow who develops vaccines you know and he's like well look we can spot um, autism with almost eighty percent accuracy by doing um, uh, MRIs of the developing child and see the um, malformations in the brain uh, in utero. So he's like, how could it be vaccines? Cause they're getting vaccines later. So anyways, there's a lot to unpack there, but here's one of the reasons why, you know, high, a uh, high, uh, H, uh, hemoglobin A1C indicates that the blood sugar has been high for, uh, a while, you know, on the order of months and you're seeing the damage to the red blood cells, right? So the high um, serum uh, blood sugar uh, is actually damaging the proteins on the outside of the blood cells. And that's what the test does is it looks at how much damage has been done by the glucose in the blood. So how that actually turns into development Um of the brain all being altered, you know, we don't know exactly. And again, it's association. So, but here's a study and I'll link it. I'm pretty sure this is the right one. I pulled it up on, on, on the fly. So I'm not a hundred percent sure it's the right one, but there, I know there was one that was done by someone up in San Francisco's like spotted this, um, and did a paper on it. So, um, we can, uh, we can, we can uh, tear into that. I think that you can really also cool. link it in the chat if Mick Comage wanted to. Uh, yeah, Mick Comage yeah. wanted to Thanks look at it. Mentioning that. So um, my thoughts are, you know, there's a lot. There's a lot there as far as diet goes. Number one, you know, a lot of autistic kids or adults they have very narrow diets. Like they have. A lot of limitations on texture flavor appearance and so on and so forth it, it's very common for them to want to eat the same things and a lot of those are kind of comfort food kind of stuff a lot of snacky foods you know you see the goldfish crackers or whatever like real common of course you know it's just it's just a little nugget of carbohydrate right um autistic people tend to have um, more digestive issues you know um, a lot of kids, you see them, they've got, uh, distended bellies and they're uncomfortable. You could tell they're uncomfortable. They're always trying to, uh, uh, deal with that. And then you have all the weird stuff. They tend to have higher levels of mercury in their blood. They tend to have higher le levels of oxalates in their blood. And perhaps that is, you know, th there's a lot of, a lot that is possible in that, but I suspect it's just that they're not able to eliminate those things is is effectively because we have mechanisms to eliminate all that stuff but for some reason it's not uh, able to keep up so i know a lot of people think oh and mercury you know causes the autism and you know it may have an effect on it but i don't think there's just one factor you know i know some people are convinced it's all genetic some people are convinced it's vaccine some people are convinced it's diet and so on and so forth so um and of course, you know, even a baby in utero is exposed to whatever vaccinations the, the mothers had, you know, whatever, whatever residual, uh, um, whether it's the immune system acting to the vaccine or, you know, the, the chemicals that are put into the vaccines to make, to elicit a stronger response from the immune system, or whether it's the the pathogen itself, you know, whether it's a neutralized pathogen or a, a less dangerous pathogen, you know, all of those affect the immune system and all of those, of course, you know, all the chemicals and stuff like that are, are going to be, you know, at least somewhat uh, absorbed in the tissue of the, of the fetus. So there's so many things that could be going on there and I don't think anybody knows, but I think personally, yeah, um, autism uh, frequently starts in the womb and it might be very mild. And then you've got this uh, infant that uh, maybe perhaps comes from a mother with high blood sugar, um, perhaps has genetic components that contribute to autism or more severe autism. 
And then also um, older, getting pregnancy older, you know, uh, just like with most yes, issues. Yes, older parents, both male and female, is also right. associated with it. So now is that just because they're uh, they're already autistic and they're hard to get along with, and it took them a long time to get a mate? <laughs> <laughs> or is it a decay in the reproductive system? I mean, both could be true, right? Right, exactly. Could be epigenetic responses uh, to, you know, stressors in the environment. You know, they've had more time. Their bodies, they're older. They've Their bodies have more time to adapt to that. So there's a lot of possibilities there. But let's say you've got a... Um, uh, an infant that's born with mild autism, and then all of a sudden you're putting them on plant-based uh, formula, and they're eating strained carrots and applesauce and, you know, all that stuff that's in baby food or formula, and then you start vaccinating them. So, you know, I think it's pretty clear, number one, the carnivore diet seems to give people help people have a better, healthier immune system. So if you're uh, if you're an infant and you're eating all this garbage, your immune system is probably not that great to begin with, right? And then you start slamming some vaccines in there, you know. And I I've made the argument many times that you know they really well for one they are working on tests to, to see who um, is like more likely to respond less positively to um, vaccinations. And at the very least, they can spread them out you know, instead of giving them a whole bunch at one time, you know, they're, they're frequently given in groups, right? But even you take your dog to the vet and to get vaccinated. And, and you know, I had one dog, Stumpy. He was a, a very healthy, um, spry dog. And uh, I, I would, you know, the first time they gave him multiple vaccines at one time, he got sick, you know, and the vet's like, oh yeah, we just have to space them out in the future. It's like, it's common, you know, it's like, I don't know. I don't know the 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 rate, but let's say one out of twenty dogs has that response. You know, they get very sick. So imagine doing that to an infant whose brain's developing and might already have some um, altered uh, brain development. So, um, and then you know the inflammatory response alone. There's been quite a bit of debate as to why so many autistic people have larger heads. You no. Know? Quite a few of them have smaller heads too, but it's just widely suspected that the larger cranium um, comes about because of inflammation around the brain, in the brain, around the brain. So the skull, you know, when the skull is forming, it actually gets larger, and and, and that can easily be confused with the fact that a lot of times, physical the 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 body doesn't develop as fast as the head does, and uh, so when they're they're charting little kids, they'll notice like, well, it's not as tall as he should be, but his head's big. Or his head's on 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 target, but his body's small, you know. And when they start seeing those differences, and they start suspecting things like autism, there's there's other conditions as well. But uh, you you hang out with a bunch of Aspies, and you'll notice that they typically have unusual heads. So <laughs> it's just it's a thing. And and again, these are associations. We don't really know the mechanism behind them. And I know I'm going to get lots of hate mail for everything i said there's somebody that hates hates that out there so i i've been in the debate wars long enough to know that you know there's just people that are entrenched in it being genetic people entrenched in it being vaccines and people entrenched in it being you know whatever you know carbohydrates so well, and another thing is uh you know so like you said one of the side effects of the vaccines is typically fever and inflammation you know and so one thing is people giving Tylenol after the vaccine. So now you're adding another, uh, uh, which is irritant, if nothing else, on top of everything else. And so it could just be an, an over, you know, overstimulation of the immune system, like you said. We don't yeah, know, it, but, it, it's you know. It's hard on the liver, you know. Right. Acetaminophen is hard on the liver. So and it has the coating that goes through the blood you know, barrier in the gut as well. You got the clicks going on now. Oh. You want to sure I can bounce your headset. So anyways, um, yeah. So back to his original question, I read that there is a high overlap between autism and metabolic disorder. Do you have any more info on this? Well, kind of covered a lot of possibilities everything from the baby food on why digestive issues are so common 
I don't really know, but food choices are often poor because the people just, you know, autistic people a lot of times, like I said, have a very narrow diet and it tends to be carby, um, sugar laden, uh, comfort foods. So, I mean, that is just my general observation of, uh, you know, the people that I've, I've talked to and interacted with who would be surprised if you're eating a bunch of carby food that you're, you're going to have, uh, some sort of metabolic disorder. So high blood sugars, you know, and, and there, they, those type of foods tend to be uh, emotionally stabilizing. So you wind up with more anxiety, you wind up with more withdrawal, you wind up with more depression and so on and so forth. And then that leads to more comfort food, you know? So I, I mean, you hear about kids that only eat French fries or goldfish or, you know, whatever all the time. And it's tough to help them, help them change, especially when they're really young, you know, um, or especially if they can't communicate very well. So it, get, it gets difficult, but uh, those are my suspicions. So hopefully Justin's back in a second here. We'll move on to a new topic, but uh, I'm just going to read uh, Michael Maj's uh, comment. He said he uh, fed his cat canned meat even when he was a vegan. She was munching cat and tiny murderous beast. She didn't have claws and would still hunt hummingbirds, rabbits, and rattlesnakes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I've got a dog. Um, my dog's in carnivore as long as I have. So, and she's, I'm not sure how old she is. She's somewhere between probably 16 and 19 years old, something like that. She was a young adult when I got her. And I don't even remember what year that was. So anyway, she's doing great. Um, she just eats meat. She eats uh, her when I'm cutting up steak, she's standing right there eating steak. And of course, I eat my steak raw. So she eats raw steak all the time. And I pretty much my dog and I eat the same thing, except she likes chicken a little more than I do. So I cook her chicken or we cook her. We cook her chicken and she gets chicken thighs and stuff. But she loves shrimp. She loves steak. She loves hamburgers. She loves cheeseburgers. She loves Brunschwager, she loves everything jerky. I dehydrate liver for her and make little uh, treats. You know, there's a little like liver jerky, just plain. She eats that. I, I make uh, regular steak jerky for her. She loves that. It's plain. It's something else I eat as well. So, so yeah, she seems to be doing really well. Well, she's a rat terrier, so she's a real high energy dog. And even at her age, she still runs and, and jumps and stuff like that. Uh, I want to come home. You know, she's always happy to see me. So she's always so run up and down the stairs because she's just so excited that I'm home, you know. And then so run around the house, slide across the slick floors, crash into stuff. And, you know, she's just, just a healthy, happy, spunky little dog at however old she is 16 plus so so yeah and I, it's interesting because uh you know you, you read stuff because of course you're always seeing vegan propaganda on facebook especially and some of them are actually uh like um they 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 will admit that cats are hyper carnivores but not necessarily dogs and some of them agree dogs are, but somehow they can't draw the line between humans, the human diet and their diet. So, yeah, it's a little rough, but um, hopefully all the pets out there are going to eat better. Um, hopefully we'll get that that message across because, you know, dogs did not. I, I mean, I, I had this discussion with the vet one time. I'm like, do you realize they don't even list the carbohydrate content on the dog food? And uh, I'm like, how much carbohydrate do you think a dog should eat? And and I'm like, I read it should be less than 5% of their diet. And she's like, well, I don't know, but I think it would be more than that. And then I said, you realize when they list the protein on here, when they list crude protein, a lot of it's just nitrogen and there's no amino acids. So why do they list it as protein if there's no amino acids? And she's like, hmm, I don't know. And of course, I found this out because my dog Stumpy got a tumor on his face, and that tumor was related to eating dog food. That's probably Justin beeping me right now, saying, ah, I can't get back in. My computer crashed. Holy cow, what am I going to do? 
Yeah, Justin has to reboot. So I'm just going to rattle on and rattle on and rattle on. So anyways, um, I I've, I look at it like, you know, particularly canines kind of co-evolved with us for quite a while because the evidence for um, us cohabitating keeps get going back further and further. They f keep finding older and older remains of of humans and canines that live together, you know, so um and it makes sense so you have two top tier predators that that like the same food and dogs um and humans together as hunters are typically five times more successful at hunting than either one is individually so it it's no surprise that somewhere along the way a relationship developed and there's a beneficial union between canines and humans um you know, hunting together, cohabitating. I mean, you know, dogs let you know when trouble's coming, you know. Cats, they, I, I could see why cats too, because the cat diet and the human diet is very similar. And, of course, humans, you know, um, they tend to, even when they have plenty of food, they tend to attract pests like rodents, and cats are, you know, more than happy to take care of that. So that's kind of what they do. And of course, if you got a rat terrier, that's that's kind of in their wheelhouse too. You know, it's kind of amazing to see, particularly my dog Stumpy was a giant rat terrier, and he was super playful and just a real sweet dog. But when he saw a rodent, he turned into a completely different animal. Uh, Trixie kind of does too. Trixie's a regular rat terrier, and she, when they see a rodent, it's like that uh, switch flips, and they're just stone cold killers. They, they just grab it, shake it, break its back or neck, throw it in a pile, move on to the next one, and they're they're so proud of themselves too. You know, like the cat, they'll be like, hey, look what I got. Yeah, it, it, give me some praise because I just killed a rat. Yeah. So anyways, you know, along with getting pests and hunting food, it, it, it only makes sense that, you know, and a great companionship. I mean, you know, when you, uh, when you got a pet dog or cat, um, you know, uh, you tend to bond well. I can only imagine it was a little less cozy when they were closer to being wolves, but nonetheless, you know, the, we're both social animals, you know, human beings, uh, you know tend to collect in groups and you know canines tend to tend to collect in packs you know so both humans and canines are really designed for doing a lot of walking and so plenty of sprinting um so you know it's a nice match so anyways yeah i hope everybody out there you know um it gets to a point where they're ready to hear the message that human the original human diet is animals and that the um same is true of cats and dogs you know not not to forget a few other animals out there too you know we most likely spent a long time falling around megafauna and eating them of course we mentioned that all the time it wasn't too long ago here well, I live, you know, close to Mexico, and and uh, I follow a lot of the archaeological articles that come out. And, you know, during construction projects, they routinely uncover um, mammoth traps that still have mammoth bones in them. You know, they're man-made pit-type traps that people were building to catch mammoths. So, and they still uncover them because the Colombian mammoths were quite successful in the americas so and so were the woolly mammoths depending on on the area you're in and of course there was all the other uh megafauna you know the giant three-toed sloths the woolly rhinos the mastodons and on and on and on there's all kinds of them and a lot of them were so big they really weren't afraid of humans they wouldn't have been afraid of wolves or dogs because they're just gigantic i mean if you ever seen modern footage of of you know an elephant taking on a tiger even a giant tiger is no match for a full-grown elephant and a lot of the mammoths and mastodons were even bigger than like a full-grown african elephant so um you know they didn't have to really be af that afraid because there's they had there were so few predators that to compete with that um they saw a human being it's like well, you get too close i'm just gonna step on you <laughs> so you know and so we learned to hunt them you just you dig a dig a pit and they fall in you 
get him to stampede off a cliff. You uh, just sneak up and cut the Achilles tendon on the back, which the pygmies, I guess, were famous for. They Pygmies um, used to be elephant eaters, so I understand that the elephant's really not available to him to eat most of the time anymore. But they just sneak up, cut the Achilles tendon, the elephant was immobilized, and then they just you know, gore it with a spear and bleed it out. So there's many, many ways um, that uh, we could hunt large animals like that. And they didn't typically run away because they didn't weren't particularly fearful of us. But, of course, we're a lot smaller and we're crafty and uh, we can, you know, sneak up on them and stuff like that when we need to. But it's quite clear that is what we did for quite a long period of time. And now we live in a agrarian society where people are shoveling carbohydrates in so anyhow still waiting for justin so let me share the article that justin and i were going to talk about so it's from psychology today and it's written by georgia eads so i'm sure a lot of people are familiar with her in the low carb carnivore keto world so here we go. Bah, bah, bah. -da. So let me see if I can pull it in a little bit. Bloop, bloop, bloop. Let's see, and I got a nice ad for a chair. Obviously, I've been shopping for chairs. Those are the most ridiculous chairs I've ever seen. It's so ridiculous, I might have to get one. So, anyways, uh, new study claims that risk uh, red meat risky for heart disease and brain health. So. So it kind of goes in and tears it up. Um, and unfortunately, Justin was a lot more familiar with this article than I was. But I'll drop the, the link into the chat. And hopefully I remember to put it in the show notes. I know somebody pointed out to me uh, the other day that um, I had forgotten to. Well, Justin's coming back right when I'm trying to paste and. Everything's going on haywire. All right. So let me get old Justin in here. Whoop. I was just pulling up the article. Okay, cool. Paste it in the link, in the link in the chat. So cool. We're getting good at this thing, maybe. <laughs> Michael Maj happens to his comment was I heard that the reason cats bring us their kill is because they recognize what poor hunters we are and they take pity on us <laughs> i don't know it could be this is entirely plausible but cats kind of seem aloof i mean i have a hard time imagining most cats uh feeling a lot of pity <laughs> so but maybe they do i don't know i've always heard it's a gift they're giving gifts well, you know, when my dogs would do it, it always seemed like they were, like, so proud of themselves because, I mean, they're so efficient at killing rodents. You know, it's like, like I was saying while you were gone, it's like a, you flip a switch and it's a different animal, and they get so intense about it. And then, you know, once they got it, like, everyone saw I was at the park and Stumpy grabbed a gopher somehow, and he was attached to it. He wanted to bring it home. I'm like, not bringing any dead gophers in the house. Sorry, buddy. And he, and he looked at me. He's almost kind of whimpered and cries. And no, you got to leave it here. And he was like, Oh, come on, man. I just, I got a gopher. I want to bring it home. <laughs> so, anyways, you want to dig into the article? Sure. Um, I guess popcorn I can read or carnivore corn, carnivore crisps. There you go. You know, like as a kid in school, whoever reads first and then popcorn and you call on the, the other kid, remember? Uh, or did you avoid read? You avoided reading situations. Who so. the hell would call on me to read? <laughs> <laughs> the only the, the masochistic teachers that wanted to punish everyone in the room would ask me to read. <laughs> So this is from uh, Georgia Eads. Uh, Georgia Eads is is she straight carnivore? I don't remember. It's been a while since I yeah no. And you made the mistake I did. There's no S on the end of her name, right? 
it's Georgia Eid. Georgia Eid. Well, yeah. you know what? It's her fault. She needs to add the S. Yeah, we should write her a letter and say, hey, please add an S <laughs> in your name because we can't say it right. Right. There you go. <laughs> Georgia Eid. Uh, MD, uh, I believe she's a psychiatrist, if I remember correctly. Hence why she's writing in psychology today. Don't know why it just says MD. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, new study claims red meat risky for heart and brain health. Researchers link carnitine, a nutrient in meat, to high TMAO. And TMAO again is oh, Tela. Uh, <laughs> I had it, but try, I had to reboot. Try methylene and oxide. In, in oxide. Try methylene yeah. and in oxide. Yeah, there you go. Say it three times fast. It'll be fun, I promise. Trimethylene and oxide. Trimethylene and oxide. Hey, there you go. Good job. Uh, you get your gold star for the day, Tom. So there you go. Aww. This was posted in August 8th, so this month. So here we go. A new study by researchers at Tufts University and the Cleveland Clinic published on August 1st, claims that higher red meat intake is associated with increased risk for heart attacks and strokes, partly because it contains carnitine, a nutrient found only in animal source foods, particularly red meat. The researchers explained that gut bacteria transform carnitine into a substance called TMAO, which promotes blood vessel inflammation increases clotting tendency and traps cholesterol in the body oh no not trapping cholesterol in the body which is a weird thing to say uh, but yeah is it supposed to just be spewing out of us all the time <laughs> right yeah, that's what i like <laughs> trapping like is it, uh they're just playing off people's fear of cholesterol right that's what it sounds like there i mean there's no link to trapping cholesterol in the body right it's took, just like a statement took, of fact took the cholesterol out of your body you would not live for 12 seconds <laughs> <laughs> not uh, that we can do that in the name of science because killing people is kind of frowned upon but just right saying. Uh, more than 75 news outlets around the world have already picked up the article uh, does that mean you should worry that eating red meat could cause you to have a stroke or a heart attack? Unfortunately, this happens to be a nutri nutrition epidemiology study, so it's not capable of providing meaningful information about the question that we can use to guide our food choices. Nutrition epidemiology findings cannot be taken seriously because the methodology used is wholly unscientific. And hey, can we is, pause? Sure. Can we just do some drive bys on nutritional epidemiology because it's really one of my favorite punching bags. Sure. Go ahead. Take the wheel, or I guess that gives you shotgun. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the misnomers that we've been indoctrinated with come from nutritional epidemiology. So, they hand out surveys. People ask them what they ate for long periods of time, often years and years and years. And uh, they write it down and then they go and then they look at whatever diseases or however these people die and then they draw conclusions. Right. And they're weak associations at the very best. Um, it might point somebody in the direction of something to research, but there's it's so far from proof. And it it oftentimes doesn't take account anything else because they may say, well, how much red meat did you eat? But they never ask you, you know, how many bottles of whiskey did you drink a day? How many cigarettes did you smoke? And by the way, did you work in a coal mine? So, you know, there's all these other factors that that contribute to it, you know, um, that that aren't even a consideration in these studies. So a lot of times people pick up these studies, a lot of group. I'm sorry, Seventh Day Adventists. I mean, you have a you have a nice hospital and a great a great dental college. But, you know, they take uh, associations like this and then they cram it down everybody's throat to try and fear them into eating plants because uh, they had a so-called prophet named Ellen G. White who said that the um, the uh, Garden of Eden diet hadn't down to her from God said we shouldn't eat animals anymore. So there you go. It's basically nice people that belong to 
a crazy call to believe in prophets. So that's basically most of the stuff Ellen G. White said never didn't come true. So, you know, and it's all out there for everybody to look at. It's not like some crazy conspiracy theory. And I know over in Australia and um, I think New Zealand as well, their work is known under the, what is it? The asylum or something? The, uh, oh God. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those names for like a place where you go to get better. Ah, uh, hell. But anyways, they push the same propaganda there um, under different names. So it's like a global a global thing. You know, uh, a lot of people went back and reviewed the same data that the, the Seventh-day Adventists generated and came up with entirely different conclusions. So a lot of that, of course, we see this all the time in science. It's either people are trying to reinforce their dogma or they're getting paid off, right? Yeah, and uh, just uh, some of the epidemiology from the uh, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, even if uh, was true, uh, it turns out Mormons have all the same life expectancy, illness levels, etc. So pointing to not meat, because Mormons are allowed to eat meat, Seventh-day Adventists are not, but they both have the same rules on like avoiding alcohol, cigarettes, uh, Mormons avoid taurine, um, or not taurine. What's it called? What's the chemical in caffeine? Not the caffeine itself. <laughs> yeah, it the the caffeine is caffeine. <laughs> starts with the tea. Um, what? Yeah, that's in tea and coffee. Taurines? Is that it? Are you talking about tannins? Tannins. That's oh, it. Okay. Tannic yeah, it's acid. actually. Yeah. It's actually, you're actually being Mormon. You don't have to avoid caffeine. It's the tannins that you have to avoid. Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. So like they can drink soda. They drink yeah, soda, right? Caffeine. I think, you know, cause I, I got a friend who's Mormon. And I think she lets her, don't quote me on this. Cause, but I think she'll let him drink seven up, but not like Coke. So it could be because, you know, seven ups clear. Um, I know there probably is no tannins in it, so maybe that's it. Yeah, possibly. I mean, right. So yeah, Mormons can drink soda, the tea well, technically because of the tannins. Could I say hi to Christina? Of course. She's got jury duty tomorrow. Oh, just tell them you're a radical anarchist that doesn't believe in the sovereignty of the state. They'll they'll. I'll let you write out. <laughs> or you could tell them, oh, I'm here to, uh, I'm a firm believer in jury nullification. That'll also get you written out. Yeah, my boss uh, just had, just got, just dodged the jury duty bullet and was very busy at work. My boss is like, he's like, hey, it, just don't go. And if you don't go, just, uh, and you get caught, just tell me you want a jury trial. <laughs> Uh, oh, you did miss an interesting conversation about autism and uh, relation to metabolic disease. So I mean, uh, we, we were talking about how sad we were that you weren't here. Yes, absolutely. But now you're here, so it's all better. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, we talked a lot about autism didn't we, before we got to this article. Right, we did. But that's kind of what we do here. So there we go. Uh, but I can continue. Let's see. The more than 75 news outlets picked up the article. Uh, so should you worry about meat and heart attack and stroke, uh, epidemiology, uh, nutrition epidemiology relies on memories, not measurements. Science requires data, objective and quantifiable. Quantifiable nutrition epidemiologists do not generate dietary data because they do not measure actual food intake. Instead, they use memory based questionnaires that force people to estimate their intake of a select list of foods over long periods of time. Uh, there's excerpts below. Um, usual dietary habits over the past year were assessed in 1989 to 1990 using a validated 99 item picture sort food frequency questionnaire. Try saying that three times fast. Um, adapted from the National Cancer Institute, and again from 95 to 96, using a validated 
Will it semi-quantitative FFQ? What Here we are. Here's another, uh, you know, uh, if you're carnivore, is another uh, villain, just like um, Seventh Day Adventist and uh, Ansel Keys, the old Walter Willett from the Harvard School of Ridiculous Eating. Mm, okay, thought the name sounded at least somewhat familiar. Uh, for each FFQ, participants were asked to indicate how often. On average, they had eaten given amounts of various foods during the past year. Notice people were asked to remember what they had eaten over an entire year. How accurately do you think you would quantify all the foods you have eaten since August 2021? Most people can't remember what they ate last week, yet alone the last 12 months. The study claims to have followed nearly 4,000 participants for more than 12 years, yet researchers only inquired about diary intake twice once in 1990 and once in 96, as if intake during these two years would accurately represent intake over the entire 12 plus years of follow-up. One of the FFQs only contained 99 food questions and the other probably contained no more than 131 items. Yet the typical US market contains thousands of food items. Don't all the other foods <coughs> matter? Uh, it's unclear which version of Professor Willett's FFQ was used because the authors provide three different citations. Below is a description of the FFQ. Um, so let's see. Uh, so this uh, is basically Georgia E blowing holes in this article that went, that was rather popular in the news cycle. Thank you, Georgia E for putting some sanity back in this brainwashing BS that <laughs> that that we're constantly inundated with. Totally. Um, totally. So props to you, Georgia Ede. Um, I think we get the gist of it. Um, let's just read the conclusion. Furthermore, the researchers' theory about meat and TMA were correct, then fish should have been much more strongly associated with cardiovascular disease risk than red meat because fish naturally contains high amounts of TMAO. Whereas the carnitine in meat has to be first converted to TMAO in the intestine by gut bacteria, yet this new study found no association between fish and cardiovascular disease. So uh, Norwegian fishery scientists have rightfully taken issue with this illogical fish contains law. You froze and I lost my place. Uh, contains lots of TMAO, team. but don't fear fish fear red meat argument in more than one scientific rebuttal, including this one. It's all about Mic fear. Microbial trimethylamine in oxide as a disease marker, something fishy. Oh, there's a link there. Fishy indeed. Uh, and it says hungry for more, and there's more studies. So thank you, George Eads. Uh, OS. Georgia Ede, we greatly appreciate. Hey, if you listen to this, you want to come on our show and you want me to mispronounce your name on per, on per in person, um, go ahead and come on. We'd love to have you, of course. Uh, we do appreciate you going out there. Big props to you for pushing against the grain. Uh, I typically have a lot of beef with psychology today now with uh, nowadays, but this is a decent article and occasionally they let someone publi publish something uh, decent. So hooray for that. Any other comments on this left, Tom? No, I just was going to say I saw, you know, since we were talking about fish, you know, and eating fish, and, of course, eating, you know, fresh fish or even frozen fish. I don't care. Pickled fish is good for you. But uh, I was, you know, uh, Dr. Lisa, Lisa Wiederman, Yes. She was on Dr. Kilt's uh, YouTube channel this morning. And I was chatting with her. And she's like, oh, I'm going to be on uh, Dr. Kilt's uh, channel this morning. And so um, he was doing another show before the one with Lisa started. And it was about fertility. Him and another doctor were talking about fertility. And they were talking about all kinds of supplements and stuff, you know, to help people with fertility. But one of them was um, fish oil supplement. And all I could, it was all I could do to not start commenting. Yeah, but what about the aldehydes? How do you get fish oil supplements without aldehydes? Aren't the aldehydes more dangerous than 
any positive effect the fish oil is going to have is all I could do not to just bomb the hell out of their their chat. Well, maybe you can send Dr. Kilt's uh, Bart's work on the uh, fish oil thing. Better that I send it to him before Bart gets a hold of the, the video. <laughs> <laughs> also, good point. Although Bart's been neutered due to no, YouTube. Yeah, they, they just he still puts out some outrageous content on other platforms. It's just you can see him breaking apart though on YouTube, where he's like having a harder and harder time not breaking uh, standards. Oh, or you. Bart's carnivore durable. He'll be fine. Oh, he'll be fine. I just think his channel will get <laughs> smacked uh, a a disciplinary action again. Well, there you go, everybody. Make sure you support good old Bart. Bart's not only enlightened us, he's entertained us for years. And, yeah, um, YouTube's put the screws to him. I I mean, I got to say, one of the reasons why I never wanted to be too over the top because that's what I expected to handle happen. But at the same time, Bart did a brilliant job of growing his channel by indulging people because that's the content people tuned in for that's what people wanted to see it's like back when everybody would bitch and moan about windows operating systems like well you know what they just gave us what we wanted you know it's not perfect you know so uh you know and I, like everything it's gotten better so yeah it was full of you know it was getting hacked left and right and bug here and there and needed updates all the time but you know i mean bart bart did what he did for theater just to get people to to tune in and he's he's not really like that in person so not that i've been in person with him, but i talked to him off the off the off the air as it were many times and uh i gotta say you you, you couldn't want a better uh a better uh carnivore social media pal because uh he's very supportive and very helpful and of course he's very very smart very very smart very learned and i'm um, happy for all the great work he did and i'm happy for his success and i hope everybody supports him and helps him keep going yeah no doubt so so yeah what else are we gonna crack a lack you want to talk about your disgusting tooth tooth the uh, tooth matter I, I guess uh, since you brought it up, do you want to force it have you it? now is what I'm doing. <laughs> I've got a picture of it here. Okay. Go to pull yeah. up the picture. For, it's a, for some reason it won't center on the screen, but whatever. It's about as big as I can get it. For some reason it won't. I don't think it needs to be centered. I think it's just gnarly looking on its own. Yeah. So what's going on in your mouth, man? Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> that came out of my mouth off my tooth pretty gnarly it's not a hunk of gold although that would be cool if it was a hunk of gold oh awesome thank you tom you leave that up on the screen and just leave love you uh gonna certainly put this up on the dating profile uh so interesting things yeah so i believe this is a chunk of like calculus and plaque that came out at least that's my theory. I have not had it scientifically tested. Um, and it's about like a oof, quarter inch, I would say. Like it's a Holy it's a hell of a, it's a hell of a chunk. So essentially, yeah. uh, I have not been to a dentist and I, I don't even remember tape measure and tell everybody how big that is. <laughs> sure. Um, I should have sent it to you. That would have been really funny. Get it in the mail. Check this out. Um I just send it to all my friends so that all my friends have a piece of me. There you go. Um, yeah, so I've not been to the dentist and I don't remember the last time. Might be something like between six and 10 years is my guess. And it's not because I'm scared of the dentist. It's just because I find the dentist annoying. Basically, I don't like people rooting around in my mouth. I don't have any pain. I don't have any soreness. I don't have any bad smell. Like, I just don't see a reason to go, especially since Carnivore. Um, I probably should have gone more before Carnivore. Um, but now that being Carnivore, uh, I believe what's happening is my teeth are remineralizing and my, you know, so what the calculus is, is a protective barrier, right, to the enamel of the tooth. 
to stop bacteria from putting holes in teeth, what have you, gingivitis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I used to have bleeding gums all the time, which is a sign of gingivitis. Not all the time, only when I brushed, I guess, to be more accurate. <laughs> Uh, they didn't bleed all the time just when i brushed them yeah. <laughs> right when i cleaned them they bled <laughs> when i cleaned them they bled yes exactly it was like yeah. i was a vampire except like with brushing teeth uh and like constantly having to clean sinks from like all the blood like it would be gnarly uh i used oh, no. <laughs> and and i would brush twice a day fairly religiously I mean, there's some, I'm sure there's some um, intoxicated evenings where I did not brush my teeth. But the morning after, I'm sure I did. Um, so, yeah, my teeth have, have taken a rough shot. And uh, so there's been plaque and calculus coming off slowly. Tom turned me on the idea, hey, man, why don't you just get a, a dentist kit? Because that bacteria is, like, stuck in there and it could still, like, be caught getting you sick or whatever so i've been kind of when i have time like chipping away <laughs> at my mouth i tripped away at it yesterday then i brushed my teeth and that fell out and so i was like oh the okay and so i was like oh wow that's a heck of a chunk i should share it with tom and a few other people because that's interesting and then talk about it on a show because i have no shame uh, but, you know, I'm proud of it in that I think that's the power of carnivore. If you want to talk to any vegetarian or vegans, just constantly talk to them about their dental health. Because at some point, they will experience poor dental health. I almost see how it could not be. Um, I think the problem with my teeth is being gluten-free, more plant-based, and eating tons of popcorn and constantly getting like the kernel skin, like caught in between teeth and having trouble getting that out. Um, I think that's what's caused all this. And I haven't had popcorn in, I mean, at least over three years, probably over three and a half years or so. I haven't had popcorn. Uh, and popcorn was my go-to snack daily. I mean, I would have popcorn by the cups full at least twice a day, sometimes three times a day. Sometimes if I was just a little hungry and wanted something, I'd you have help popcorn. pay for some of those bow ties that Orville Redenbacher used to wear? Oh, I would get the Boom Chicken Pop organic popcorn. So the so. expensive stuff. So, yeah. So, Although yeah. there was... Uh, let me, since you froze, I'm just going to say, you know, for all the single ladies out there, now... Uh, Justin has a mouth worth kissing because he got rid of all this calculus. You know, he's a single man living in his uh, living in his penthouse on the fourth floor. You know, so wearing sexy dragon shirts. So, all you girls out there, send him some love notes. There you go. Try and get him out of his house for a little workaholic hermit. <laughs> See, Christina knows what I'm talking about. She's had one follow up too. I haven't tried bent tonight clay yet. I've been doing um, the char activated charcoal in the toothpaste, and I, that seems to have made a big difference. And my teeth are so white and shiny. Yeah, you know, uh, I went to a business lunch uh, this past week, and they had Lucille's. Of course, I sent pictures to Justin to torture him. And uh, I was eating ribs. And of course, they had sauce on them. I ate pulled pork. There's some kind of sauce on it. There's chicken. There's some kind of sauce on it. I noticed for the first time in a long time, the next day, my teeth had a little bit of that texture on them, you know, because normally when you're carnivore and you brush your teeth, they just stay like slick and polished, right? Mm -hmm. And after I ate that kind of carby laden, delicious smoked pork and smoked smoked ribs and smoked chicken i was like hmm i got a little bit of that back and it used to be every day you know when i was on a regular everyday you know people diet with eating canola and brown rice and salad and all that other crap uh i used to get that stuff on my teeth all the time you know you're constantly trying to scrub it up 
so you don't get calculus grown, you know, like Justin had. And so just that little bit, I know it's made a difference on my teeth. Of course, I brushed it away and proceeded to eat as much uh, raw sirloin as possible, and it doesn't come back. So there. Yeah, and so to me, you know, there's all these, like, arguments about what's the perfect human diet, what's the best diet. Uh, of course, me and Tom have our bias. I just think we're right. But anyone that has bias <laughs> believes they're right. What? So no, we're right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think when it comes to a vegetarian or vegan uh, diet, I think, hey, how's your teeth doing? I think that could easily be a slam dunk because uh, I haven't met a person that's been a long-term vegetarian, vegan that hasn't had to cop to some kind of dental issue. Um, you know, I often start the conversation. People are like, how, how can you just eat meat? And I'm like, well, if human beings weren't just eating meat, they would have never made it because it would have died from dental decay, you know? I mean, imagine before dentistry, before toothpaste, before toothbrushes. Imagine you're just in this carby world eating, uh, even if it's just fruits all the time. Imagine eating fruit all year long. What would the hell would happen to your teeth if you had no way to take care of them? Right. And, you know, people don't put that together. We're not taught that. I don't even they sure don't dentists that stuff are taught that. Right. They assume it was available because you have to eat it because people like Seventh day Adventist and Ansel Keys and Walter Willett are always pushing their their personal biases for whatever reason, religious, scientific dogma, whatever. And I think people thought we just chewed on sticks or something to keep right. our teeth clean, bark. Something like that. Some yeah, flying. so we, we know now because when you find fossils, particularly fossils less than, say, 30, 40,000 years old, there's often still collagen in them. And then, of course, we find uh, the skeletal remains, right, the bones, the teeth, and stuff like that of humans and prehumans and other animals. And when they test the nitrogen isotopes, or the 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 uh, stable isotopes is nitrogen. It's not the only one. Um, they can figure out exactly what that or animal is eating. So we know that the highest the our, the the highest uh, plant content of any of those ancient peoples was maybe fifteen percent, and that appeared to be starchy tubers. So um, and the the other the other thing is the chyme or chime from those are the partially digested vegetation that the animals that 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 they were eating had already eaten so that made up the bulk of whatever vegetation they're eating because 99 percent of all the plants in the world are, are toxic to human beings outwardly toxic to human beings even the humbled potato all wild potatoes are toxic to human beings so how the hell were we eating them until we learned to, how to breed ones that were less toxic? And I mean, just tr just try and eat a raw potato right now. So how how how, the, how did we evolve all that time without the use of fire, without pottery, without methods for detoxifying? I mean, you could detoxify an acorn if you really want to, but why would you if you could eat a freaking mammoth? Acorns don't even taste good. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> right. You feed them to the pigs, right? Wild, yeah. Well, if you want some nice ham, <laughs> but you know, pigs pigs can digest them, you know. So I mean, pigs can eat all kinds of things. <laughs> we wouldn't touch with a ten foot pole, or we certainly wouldn't eat them too many times before it was game over. So, yeah. And then uh, your favorite factoid, Tom, when talking about dental health. Mm. Hit me. It's your favorite. You know which one it is. Catching me off guard. Uh, so oh, the, the one about about uh, Candida and uh, and Streptococcus living yeah. in, the front of in your mouth. They kind of cohabitate and help each other break down starches to, to fuel themselves. Which of course nobody's crazy about Candida and Streptococcus living in their mouth. So stop feeding it. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. Right, and it feeds off starch and sugar. So there you yeah. go. Uh, yeah, those even McDonald's um, fries, those even Staphylococcus, right? Staphylococcus hominis, which lives on your skin. Again, right. the more carbohydrate laden you are, the more it flourishes. 
and who wants <laughs> who wants a staph infection? I'm just saying, <laughs> right? And if and you think, Tom then, hits the hits the gym really, really uh, quite often, and I mean, no ringworm, right? I mean, not in years or whatever. And I've never actually grabbed up on nothing. I've never never actually had ringworm. I've had athlete's foot since I was a little kid. It's come and gone. So that's and that's what triggers my psoriasis. Is when I was a kid, I wore corrective shoes, and then it seemed like no no shoes ever fit right. So my toes are all crammed in there, funny and. And that's how I got reoccurring infections. And eventually, anytime I get um, the tiniest little outbreak on a toe or something, then then my immune system will react and I get psoriasis. So it took a long time to figure out. I thought it was my diet because people talk a lot about um, leaky gut. And leaky gut uh, has been, I don't know if it's been proven, but it's, it's certainly strongly associated with things like psoriasis and eczema. Um, and, and back to our, the discussion earlier about autism, you know, it's, if you've got a little kid with, that's already got eczema or something, you might want to spread out those vaccines and not give them to them all, all, at one time because they already have a very active immune system. And if you trigger a really strong immune system reaction, you could, you could potentially worsen the autistic symptoms. So, but yes, um, yeah, I, I do. I do hit. I do love me some gym time. I think last month I, I was in the gym thirty four times in one month somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so they they keep track and they write it on this whiteboard. And when you walk in, I was like, I was like number one. I was like, wow, look at that. Everybody else is a snacker. But now I don't. I don't go to the gym that much because I think everybody should go to the gym that much. I just go because I love lifting. So. Yeah, don't try that at home. Although I gotta say, I think carnivore on carnivore people recover a lot faster. So you know, if you look at the scientific papers, and I know Bart's talked about this, it's like, you know, you shouldn't work out, you know, with that kind of frequency because you haven't had time to recover. But I'm always working out on a different, a different part of my body or different sets of muscle groups on different days, and I feel like they recover nicely. So. I've managed to add muscle and get leaner, albeit at a relatively slow pace compared to how fast some people have lost weight. I didn't pull a Emily Penton and drop a hundred pounds in 10 months or whatever insane <laughs> pace she had. And people do that. Um, but uh, Emily doesn't, does, isn't into going to the gym and lifting heavy e easier. And I'm older than she is. I've been on a zillion yo-yo diets uh, since I was a little kid. And I think that contributes to it. Your body's just like, we're going to hold on to this fat because you seem to have this problem with losing it and then gaining it back again. And we're just going to keep you alive by keeping you super uh keeping plenty of fuel on board or something like that so i mean it's it's no surprise you know it's been looked at before as the the more times a yo-yo diet it the the harder and harder it gets to get lean but it's happening and you know one of the advantages to getting lean slower too is you typically wind up with a lot less loose skin we know lots of people they're like they go carnivore year two years three years in they're nice and lean but they've got that loose skin, you know, and uh, some people can fast it off and some people can't. And so far, uh, considering, oh, Christina works out every day. Never get sore. Thanks to carnivore. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not going to say I never have any soreness, but it's like we're super mild, you know, back in the day, man, it's like you do some, you start cranking some, muscles you didn't and, and like the pain would be could be excruciating for like two days you don't want to move you're like can't even scratch your nose <laughs> because your biceps are burning two days later you know so yeah i don't get any of that i do get some some soreness but it's it's minor it's minor it feels more like a reward <laughs> than, than it does a torture so of course you know maybe i'm a little bit of a masochist i don't know but anyways yeah and, you know a lot of that is also proper form right so you it know could be the more form. experienced in the gym and lifting and all that stuff so that you know how to do it without putting strain on the joints and all that stuff too which is i think that's the primary thing 
Don't quote me. Don't come after me, Bart. But I think that's the primary issue is, you know, you end up burning out joints. I, I suspect a lot of it was inflammation because it would be a lot of um, burning in the center of the muscle, you know, in the thickest part of the muscle it seemed to be where it hurt the most. And of course I had, I had arthritis that gradually got worse, which caused the joint pain. So Christina says she does a lot of kettlebell work. Yeah. Um, a lot of people do well with kettlebells. I'm kind of just more traditional free weight guy, but I use the cables and stuff like that. I use the leg machines because there's so many special uh, like leg movements that are really hard to do with free weights. Um, so, but I'm at the point now where every single leg machine in the, in the, uh, in the place I do, the full stack on every single one of them. So, and it's funny because, you know, I was, I was thinking about what Bart was saying about, you know, sets of eight, two sets of eight. Um, you should be able to do two sets of eight, no more or less. That's like, sort of like the line of efficiency as far as hypertrophy and strength training, like where they come together is that you should lift uh, the maximum weight you can lift eight times in two sets is sort of like, uh, sort of a clinical goal and a lot of those machines are like they're maxed out and i could do i could do five sets of 20 if i wanted to so i'm not really sure what bart's plan is to uh create a company with with heavier machines or what <laughs> so, <laughs> bigger kettlebells for christina she's gonna need a she's gonna need a 30 pood uh, the kettlebell pretty soon. <laughs> so, anyways. well, maybe you just need me to lay on the weights. Ah, I need like a couple of Justins on there, right? <laughs> and what was you did a deadlift? You said earlier. I've been, put, last... been, uh, been putting off uh, deadlifts and squats, heavy squats for a while because it's getting a tiredness in my lower back, like in the psoas. And I thought, well, let me uh, let me do, you know, circle back, give it some time. Um, pre the COVID lockdown, I think my deadlift was uh, for sets, not like max, but was I was doing like 470 or something like that. And then I never really got, or never really recovered to that that sort of weight. And then um, now it's uh, today i did 385 for sets so nice yeah i have a i have a sort of a poor man's x3 bar so justin's got the real deal my, i talked to my buddy aaron into buying the real deal but uh i used to use like a six foot bar and a bunch of bands so Justin, <laughs> Justin picked that up again. Tried, tried to do overhead press with it. He's like, "No way, man! I feel like a child wrestling with it." <laughs> I forgot what you said, <laughs> but yeah, um, a lot. You know, people, you get to a certain size, and then like stuff isn't wide enough. You know, so I mean, Justin will tell you, I, I kind of walk side. I have to like turn to go through some of the doorways and stuff. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> not a small person so not all the gym equipment fits but you know anyways yeah i look at the little x3 because i've i've played with the x3 bar at my friend's house and it was, it was i think i'm a little past uh i'm gonna have to order the another set of bands for it or something if i get it so but it is nice the x3 bar is great i mean it's compact it's, it's very well made you know, I like that. A lot of gym equipment is not not as high a quality as that. So I really appreciate the what went into that. And if I didn't have a bunch of <laughs> gym equipment cluttering up my house, I probably would start over with an X3 bar. So maybe I should just get rid of it and get an X3 bar because I, I really – I'm one of those people that really needs to get rid of a lot of stuff and be more minimalist. And, uh, yeah, so – anyways well you always have access to a gym so yeah I don't know if it's really you know my thing is is that it's super convenient i mean i talk about it i don't know if i'd say i talk about it all the time but i talk about it fairly uh 
regularly when people ask and I love it. I get what I need out of it. I've been getting results. I like it because I've been I've put my body through a lot of stress. I'm not a gym rat. Um, and so <clears throat> I just like that I can, you know, just take get it, get it done, get it done in the morning. Don't have to go use gas or see people. <laughs> I can listen to a podcast or something and then I can go to the weight room and do like some ab work or something or do like ab work here. And I feel it takes me about an hour and I feel like I've really uh, put in the work. I've been gaining weight, which is kind of interesting for me. I I think yesterday I went on the scale, try to measure weekly just to see what's up. And I'm now, I think, 150 pounds, but everything's still still fitting the same and everything. So I've been slowly gaining this year um which is kind of interesting but i still am like leaner than before carnivore even though i'm essentially the same weight now which is crazy to think about or maybe it's all hair maybe i've just been maybe i've just grown like five pounds of hair five pounds of hair (laughs) you're gonna be like that sheep that ran away and was hiding in the cave for 10 years and came out a giant (laughs) puffball right yeah justin in his mountain cave Mm-hmm. Just growing hair at the top, <laughs> just growing hair. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. So anything else or shall we wrap her up or we could wrap her up. Unfortunately, our guest didn't make it. Um, but Hey, we'll, we'll have to do it another time. Uh, I'm sure he'll be, he'll be thrilled to come on. Uh, but other than that, please make sure you are subscribed. Uh, Thanks, hit that like button. If you haven't already, Hit that notification bell so you know whenever we're live. Who knows? We might hit you with one of these on Friday since I'm not working. Maybe I, maybe Tom will let me steal the account. I keep trying to sure. talk him into letting me do a, a drunk stream. I was going to sure. drink. <laughs> Just sure, get smashed. <laughs> we'll talk behind, behind the scenes. Um, yeah, we appreciate the questions. We appreciate you all talking. Uh, good luck with jury duty. Like I said, just tell them, you know, fun things about yourself or you know no victim no crime that's another good one you you get a bench warrant it's not my fault (laughs) i've never had to go to jury duty i've never even been summoned i hate you like i think uh yeah on occasion (laughs) i'm registered huh but yeah, I've never had to do jury duty. It's hey, really let's fun. remind people that there is now a Facebook Meet Mosaic um, uh, Facebook group, right? Facebook there, group, Telegram group. Uh, yeah, my... there's Telegram group for you guys that love Telegram. Jump on in there. Let's keep in touch. Maybe you got some ideas. Maybe you want to come on the show. Uh, maybe you just want to hook up with Justin. Uh, whatever. <laughs> And uh, Amanda and there's a, um, Becky, for those that may or may not know, they've got a new Locals. Uh, I wish we had the link handy. I do not, though. Um, maybe I could yeah. pull it up. Remind me of putting the show notes in. Hey, guys, if you see the show notes and I forget to put links to studies or articles or Amanda and Becky's new group in there, it's, don't, feel free to leave me a comment. Well, I always look forward to seeing you guys' comments and look forward to seeing you in the chats but come join us uh maybe you want to join autistic carnivores it's a good group it's kind of my my uh main sort of you know it's the it's the facebook group i work the most on it's probably my passion project so anyways come on over and join us share your articles share your studies share your anecdotes the more anecdotes the better so. Definitely. N of one times 20,000 is no longer an N of one. So there That's we right. go. All right, kids. Thanks for coming. Look forward to seeing you again next week. There are a couple of um, uh, short ribs I dusted off and set up. So one's coming out this Woo-hoo. Wednesday and Wednesday Yay. after. And hopefully, well, Justin's got Friday off. I think my chances of getting Friday off are slim to none, but you never know. And you uh, record from the office. You're usually the only one there on Friday. <laughs> yeah, but I have to work. <laughs> so. What's work? What is that? Yeah. What work? is that? Hmm. What is that? So. But uh, anyways, thanks, everybody. Love you all. And uh, keep growing our community. 
try to keep uh, carnivores from eating other carnivores. And whatever you do, whatever you do, don't fall down the carb hole. Carb hole.